When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who is still very proud of his summer stock. Here is the captain. Well, thank you, Balf. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. We are still sipping on some heavy boots of lead from the single cut beer smiths. This is one of, if not the biggest, most complex beers from the good folks over at Single Cut. This Imperial style is rich with mega chocolate, vanilla, and coffee in an astonishingly smooth monster of a brew. Four out of five bottle caps. And let's give some praise and thank you to our friends that helped us out with this week's beer fund, filling up the old garage fridge. First up, a cheers to Jennifer in Fort Worth, Texas. And a big we like to jib to Taylor in High Rolls, New Mexico. Next, Captain, we have a shout out to Jill in Shepherd, Montana. And a big shout out to Alyssa in Harrisonville, Missouri. Next, we have Jennifer Vaughn in Parts Unknown, and we also have Brina Sieber in Parts Unknown. Everybody we mentioned, they went to our website, truecrimegarage.com, helped us out with this week's beer fund. And for that, well, we thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-R-U-N, Beer Run. If you need more True Crime Garage for your earballs, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on our Off the Record link and sign up for Off the Record. It's a monthly subscription to Stitcher Premium. You get all Stitcher Premium shows. It's like the Netflix of podcasts, and you get all that for $5 a month. So check that out. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right. Thank you, Captain. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Howard Unruh is often referred to by many authors and reporters as America's first mass murderer. He gunned down 13 individuals, killing 13 people September 6th, 1949 in the buildings and businesses that surrounded his home that he shared with his mother. During the months leading up to his murder spree, Howard spent less and less time outside the house and became more and more suspicious of his neighbors who thought he was strange and made fun of him and called him a mama's boy. He wrote about them and what he thought they said about him in his diary, marking some names with the word retail, R-E-T-A-L, short for retaliation. Howard seemed to be in the mental state that everybody is out against him and how everybody is wronging him. And he didn't necessarily have a hit list, but in his diary, he kind of had a hit list. 
Yeah, he's like making mental note as well as notes in his diary about all these individuals that either wronged him in some way. And keep in mind, some of these grievances are so minute that it's almost like I don't know that the person would know that they did something to offend him or upset him. And so he he's keeping tally, if you will, of all these individuals that live near he and his mother. If they wronged him in any way, then he's writing retal as in retaliate. You know, I'm going to retaliate against this person. This in a weird way is just a continued behavior of what he was doing when he was in the army and off at World War II. You know, he was documenting a lot of things in his diary during that time as well. And it didn't just have to do with his kills or what his wartime victim looked like as when he went up to look at the face of the man that he had just killed or take something from the soldier's uniform. This included things like what he was eating, where they were. You know, it wasn't uncommon for individuals to keep a diary or a journal of their time at war. Too bad Howard didn't have Instagram. And write letters back to their loved ones. But what was odd was this behavior of writing about his kills and and the, the people that he killed during his time in war. When he returns from war, he's maintaining these diaries, but he's not killing anybody at this time. It almost looks like he's thinking about killing some of these people and writing it in his journal and keeping track of these individuals that he believes have wronged him in some form or fashion. Well, we all know somebody that doesn't think life worked out the way they wanted to, but instead of it being in their hands, that it's the world is out to get them. And those people, you could say something as a joke or in jest, and they, and they months later bring up how mad at you they are. And you're like, I didn't mean it that way. I was just joking. Well, and this is a personality trait, a character flaw, if you will, that we have seen in other types of killers that we've profiled on this show. Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. It was said by everybody that examined him and reviewed all of his manifesto and his activities in his life after he was apprehended. And they all said the same thing. This is a guy that couldn't let things go. He would hold grudges. This is a guy that if you wronged him or you did something that he deemed to be wrong, he would hold it against you for years, decades, if not the rest of both of your lives. And it seems like Howard Unruh shared this character flaw with somebody like that of Ted Kaczynski. Now, Captain, oftentimes when we review these stories, there are weird situations that you just cannot make up. You can't. You don't even often know what to do with them at times, but they're so unique that you have to include them in your telling of the true crime story. And this is a bit of a bizarre situation that took place. Shortly after, Howard Unruh guns down 13 people and then flees back to his apartment. Remember, we left off yesterday talking about the standoff between he and the police that surrounded his home. Now, during the course of that standoff, we had this brilliant little news reporter that gets this great idea. He had figured out that it was Howard Unruh or believed that it was Howard Unruh who had gone through the streets and into these businesses shooting and killing people. And I'm guessing that he got this from information off of the people on the streets, these eyewitnesses that we talked about. So he has this brilliant idea of, you know what? I'm going to get the scoop, the inside scoop. I'm going to get my name in the paper and I have a story to tell and I'm going to call the Unruh household and see if I can get Howard on the phone. This is the middle of the police shootout. So the reporter was a one Philip Buxton and he was successful. And I will read portions of his article, not the entire article, but It says, Howard Unruh, wholesale killer, was not too busy to answer the telephone today while he was still shooting it out with police at his home on River Avenue. Now, keep in mind, back in the 40s, back in 1949, the news was everything. And there were often papers that were released during the morning and then papers that were released in the afternoon or evening. And a lot of times people would have subscriptions or purchase both the morning and the evening news. 
And so this is coming from the Evening Courier, which was the evening newspaper. So because Howard Unruh went about his killing spree at the nine o'clock hour that morning, it was able to make it into the evening news. And that's why our reporter is saying he was not too busy to answer the telephone today while he was still shooting it out with police. Buxton goes on to say, I was about to hang up. So he found Howard Unruh's phone number in the phone book called the home. He's dialing, it's ringing, it's ringing, and he's waiting for Howard to pick up. And he says, I was about to hang up thinking my hunch had been a dud when I heard the receiver go up and the other end of the line, hello, said a strong, clear voice. Is this Howard? I asked. Yes, said the voice. This is Howard. What's the last name of the party you want? Breathless, I strained my ears to catch the sound of shooting. But there was only silence. It seemed as though the man at the other end of the line had clapped his hand over the receiver to shut out the sound. Then the voice, as if stalling for time, repeated, What's the last name of the man you want? Unruh, I said. Who are you and what do you want? I'm a friend and I want to know what they're doing to you. Well, they haven't done anything to me yet. But I'm doing plenty to them, responded Howard. How many have you killed, I asked. I don't know yet. I haven't counted them. But it looks like a pretty good score. Why are you killing people, I asked. Howard responds, I don't know. I can't answer that yet. I'm too busy. I'll have to talk to you later. A couple of friends are coming to get me. And with that last statement, Howard hung up the phone. During the middle of the police shootout, He has a conversation with the reporter in which asked why he's killing people. He says, I don't know yet. Uh, Basically, I'm too busy to have figured that out at this point. Got my hands full. And just as you would expect from Howard Unruh, when the reporter says, I'm just wanting to know what they're doing to you, meaning the police with the shootout and everything that's going on, Howard's response is that of uh, somebody that's in some kind of unknown competition to everybody else where he says, they haven't done much to me yet, but it looks like I'm doing plenty to them. So Howard believes he's winning at this point in this bizarre competition that he's having. After Howard is apprehended, of course, he's going to be interviewed by police and by detectives, and they all kind of say the same thing here, Captain, that he appeared to be, and this is based off of his appearance and his words and his statements to police, that he appeared to be calm and sober. And that was bizarre to everybody that had witnessed this situation. He had killed so many people, it was very difficult to believe that he would be calm and sober. And we already said yesterday, when we talked about some of the statements that Howard Unruh provided to police shortly after his arrest, and in these interviews, one of them was his statement of, when I came home last night and found my gate had been taken. I decided to shoot all of them so I would get the right one. It seems to me like he had believed that possibly the Coens or one of the Coens had taken his gate to get back at him for any number of these disputes that they have already had. But obviously by this statement, what we learn is that he might have been pretty certain that it was one of the Coens that stole his gate, but he didn't know for sure. And so he was just going to shoot everybody so he would get the right one, the one that had wronged him, the person that had, in fact, stolen his gate. To me, it feels like Howard snapped, and once it was all over, he was questioning what it was all for. And he just seemed, to me, almost deflated. I don't think he was necessarily, maybe in the moment, he seemed a little cocky about everything but it seemed like afterwards he's like i know i did something horrible and i'm going to now suffer the consequences by spending the rest of my life in jail well he would ultimately apologize for killing the children that morning but of the adults he said that they deserved it and that was his statement that he kind of stuck with now speaking of interviews we've talked about the reporter who had the bright idea of calling Howard Unruh while he's shooting it out with police. 
We had the opportunity earlier to speak with Ellen Green, who is the author of A Murder in the Neighborhood, which is a book about this massacre. And as you will hear, it was really this interview along with her book that was the inspiration for us covering this case, as we simply didn't know very much about this case at the time of the interview. Hello, Ellen, and thank you for joining us here on the show. Could you introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, my name is Ellen J. Green. I am the author of a book that just came out on April 28th titled Murder in the Neighborhood. It is a nonfiction piece about the first mass shooting in the United States, what they call the first mass shooting in the United States, that happened on September 6th, 1949. Uh, Howard Barton Unruh was a 28-year-old World War II veteran that woke up one morning and he was quite angry at his neighbors and proceeded to walk down the block and shot 13 people in 12 minutes. But this story is rather complicated because I'm looking at this Howard Unruh person and so he it seems like he snapped and then decided that... Uh, He was going to go into take no prisoners mode and gunning people down. But we say neighbors, but Howard was living on the second floor above or connected to a drugstore or pharmacy. Could could you kind of describe that a little bit? Because it sounds like a unique uh, living situation. Yeah, it was a twin building that was on the corner of 32nd and River Road. And there was storefronts facing third facing River Road. Um, One was a pharmacy. The other was empty. There had been a number of businesses in there, but at this time it was empty. And above those stores were families. And one family was the Cohen family, the mother, father, uh, 12-year-old boy, and the grandmother. And on the other side, um, with a common wall, was Howard Unruh and his mother. There was a lot of conflicts between the Unruhs and the Cohens. Um, and it had, you'd, uh, there's a map in the book that kind of shows the layout of the neighborhood and what the crux of the problem had to do with the access to the backyard. The Cohens had prohibited Howard and his mother from using the gate to get the 32nd Street. Um, and so they had to cross this lot and it created a lot of conflict between them. What do you know about Howard's days spent serving this great country in World War II? So I did a lot of research and it was hard because a lot of those war records are gone, but I did come upon a memoir by somebody that was in his unit. Um, He served in the Battle of the Bulge. You know, he described in his hospital records of having to shoot prisoners of war, of having seen uh, these, these people that were really children at the time, German soldiers that were being killed. It affected him greatly, and he talked a lot about that later. There is a thought that when he started the rampage that morning, he had a kill list of people that had been bothering him. And he started out with the intent of just finding those people and killing them. But at some point, it's very clear in the whole episode when he started to spiral, that he just went into war mode. And he said he felt he was back in the military and he just started shooting random people, including three children. Yeah, I saw that. We have victims as young as six and two years old. Is that correct? Yes. He was walking down the street and he there was an apartment building with a big window facing 32nd Street. And he saw movement in the window and was really agitated at that point and just shot through the window and hit the two year old in the head. Yeah. He shot, what, uh, 16, 17 people, killing 12 of them? Yes. There were three that were wounded, 13 killed. And he's 27 years old at this time. Yeah, 28. 28. Yes. And uh, he's living with his mother. I found a newspaper article that described him as a, and maybe I'm confusing him with one of the victims. There was a pharmaceutical student involved in this it, it looks like the cohen's were were druggists that they own the river road pharmacy could you tell us a little bit more about the the people the casualties yeah so uh the pharmacist was maurice cohen that owned and operated the pharmacy and lived upstairs and his wife rose cohen the grandmother minnie cohen 
And then they had a 12-year-old son, Charles Cohen. Howard Unruh was at one time a pharmacy student at Temple University, but he had dropped out. At the time of the incident, he wasn't really doing much with his life. He was living with his mother. He wasn't working. He wasn't in school. He really did not like the Cohens. There was so much conflict between the families about this gate and about other things. And, you know, the, Howard later in his hospital records talked about the fact that he was gay. And that he was going into Philadelphia and he was seeking the company of men. His mother was extremely religious, didn't know anything about this. People kind of sensed in all the interviews that I did with the with people that still um, are alive, that they knew he was gay and they tormented him. It was illegal at that time to be gay. So they actively would call him names, Nancy boy, queer throw things at him. It made life very difficult. He particularly said that the Coens were picking on him, that they were calling him names. That was his primary target. And he had actually purchased a machete at some time before this incident. And when asked by the detectives what he was going to do, he said he had intended to decapitate all of them. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. You can live out your master chef dream. When you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that. So these people, and I'm not trying to defend Howard at all here. I, I want to be very clear about that to the audience because certainly these actions are not warranted at all. So these people are picking on him and teasing him after he risks his life serving the United States, defending our country and our freedoms in the greatest world conflict in the history of uh, of our you know current uh, time period. It's just, it's, I mean, it's, and, and I get it. I get it. It's 1949 and it was a much different world and society back then. And as you pointed out, just now it's even difficult to believe that at one time it was illegal to be homosexual. And so it's just, it's one of these things when you look at it through the lens of, of current day, it's just, uh, it's a really b- bizarre scenario. Yeah. And in, in, in the book, it outlines all of the people in the neighborhood. It kind of gives a glimpse of every uh, what was happening with the people on the neighborhood. Um, he had a very difficult time. You know, they would tease him about not being able to use the gate that he and his mother had to walk through this a lot. They would taunt him. 
They would call him names. They would throw things at him. Um, they would jump in his way when he was walking. They would mock the way he he had a, a very erect posture and stood very straight, and they would imitate him um, to the point that even coming out of his back door to try to get to the street, it would start. It's a very congested neighborhood. The houses are all kind of connected. There isn't a lot of space. So I don't think he had any way to escape any of that. Yeah, I'm looking at pictures of this area, and it looks like people just kind of living on top of one another. That's how close they were. And yeah, a, a photo of Howard here. You describe the way that he the way that he stands, his posture, the way that he walks. And the picture I'm seeing here, he he is standing exactly as you described. And he he likely is taller than the police officers that are surrounding him. This is after he is apprehended. But uh, just his posture probably makes him look taller or appear to be taller than than what he would be height wise. Now, a couple of weird things, and, and you know this case really well. But before we get to the weird things, could you tell us a little bit more about your background? We know you are the author of this this very intriguing book. Can you give us a little more about your background, Ellen? Yeah, for the past 20 years, I have been uh, a therapist in a maximum security correctional facility, doing assessments for the courts, doing um, therapy sessions with the inmates. Also during that time I was writing, I have four books that I've written before this one. What are those titles? The very first book is a standalone book called The Book of James. And then there's a trilogy, Twist of Faith absolution and silent redemption. I want to say none of this has anything to do with religion, even though they have religious titles. <laughs> right. So there's suspense. So this is your first true crime. Yes. Book. How do you think that your background, how were you able to apply that, your expertise on that level to your research and your writing of the, of, of this book, murder in the neighborhood? Well, you know, it was very interesting because I was able to get a hold of all his hospital records. And so I was able to go through and look at his testing and his IQ and and his responses during the sessions. Now, it's different than seeing a person, obviously, face to face where you can ask them whatever you want. You just have to take whatever was asked and the answers and you're not getting any inflection or, you know, the body language with that. So that was kind of intriguing. And I was working with a psychiatrist, Dr. Peter Brancato, who's a forensic psychiatrist, who went through the records with me to try to help paint a portrait, a three-dimensional picture of what this man was from what we were seeing on the page. And Howard, he lived and was, you know, uh, obviously uh, incarcerated, but he lived till 2009. So did you, yes. did you ever cross paths with him before any of your research? Have you, you've never, you've never met him or no. Him? And I was kind of upset because I got the idea to write this book and he passed away. And I was like, why didn't I do this 10 years ago when I could have gone up to actually interview him? No, I never met him. I interviewed a ton of people that did interview him though. Now in your days at the uh, maximum security facility, do you have any stories you want to share with us from, from your time there? Well, I'm actually working on another book called The Many Faces of Murder, about just about the experiences of working with these murderers and seeing these people and then coming home. Yeah, I'm married. I have two, I had two small children when I started there. They were really infants, toddlers, and trying to manage that and how I compartmentalized all of that because it was very difficult. I would, I would see a woman who brutally, brutally killed her child and filmed part of it. And then I would leave, oh, it's time to go, clock out. I have to go home and pick up my son from daycare. I don't know what I've done with all of that. I think you find a way to put it in a separate compartment. Otherwise, it's going to take over your whole life. Yeah, doing what I do, it's true crime 24-7. And I've had to figure out a way to, like you said, put that in its own little box. But at the same time, it does make me, I think, appreciate the smaller moments more than I might have with not having this experience. And so it's a, it's a unique uh, situation. You don't want to dance in the blood or stand in the doom and gloom for too long uh, as it will. It, it could, it's a, it's a 
quick drive to crazy town, as they say. But um, yeah, the funny thing is when I was finished the book and I was looking for photographs and I had the original file from the Philadelphia Inquirer, which had a lot of the crime scene photos, and I submitted them all to um, Book Chore saying, hey, I think these would be great. And I think that I'm a little warped from what I do. They were like, nah, we can't put those in there, Ellen. They're a little graphic. So I, I do think it's changed me a little bit, my perspective. There's a couple of weird things that I noticed, and maybe you could clear them up. And again, we're looking at 1949, so things are completely different back then. But it, it appears to me that that after the, the shootings, that there was some kind of standoff that he he had maybe barricaded himself inside of, I guess it was his home, his apartment. Yeah. So after the last stop, he shot the, he went into the Harry home and fired. Nobody got killed there. They were both wounded in the arm. He retreated right through his backyard, went into his house and, and just stayed there. You know, whether he went to lay down, whether he was uh, looking out the windows, but the police didn't quite know what was going on. There was a lot of confusion. And so all these police cars showed up. He had barricaded himself and they were firing at the building. So if you go and you walk down the street and you look, you can still see the pockmarks of the bullets from the police firing. It's amazing that he did not get killed. And somebody asked me, do you think he wanted them to kill him? No, he did not. He put out a white flag out the window and said, I surrender. And remarkably, they let him come down peacefully. There's pictures of him being arrested, I think, in the book at the back door. And um, taking him in, there was no scuffle. There was no nothing. A lot of times, these types, after a mass shooting, will commit suicide, turn the gun on themselves. You don't think that that was part of his quote-unquote plan? No, it didn't seem to be part of his psyche. No, I don't even think it occurred to him. He felt like these people had bothered him. They stole the gate, which is a huge part of this story that he had put in this gate so that he could have access to the yard without going through this lot. And somebody had ripped it out the night before. And that was the last straw. And he felt to his last interview that these people deserved what they got. And, and it, he had no remorse, no thoughts of hurting himself, no suicide attempts in his whole entire life. There's not even any reports of depression. And he was quite matter of fact about it. No, I'm sorry I killed the children. He didn't know that he had killed the children when he started spiraling. I'm sorry I killed the children, but the people that deserved it deserved it. How long was it after the shooting that he's apprehended? Uh, we know that he barricades himself and, and then he waves the white flag. But h- how much time... We're talking between probably that. between half an hour and 45 minutes. And what's so bizarre here is, you know, we're expecting to see, you hear this story and then you go and you want to look at a picture of, of the, the situation and of the perpetrator. And I'm looking at a picture of the perpetrator and you expect to see this disheveled, crazed madman. Right. And here we have this very clean cut, well dressed. He's wearing a blazer and a bow tie. Yes. During the commission of these murders and 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 as he's apprehended. Yes. He got dressed up for the event. He put on his best brown suit, his white shirt, his bow tie, but he had his combat boots. He always wore his combat boots. What type of gun was it? He used a nine millimeter Luger. Okay. And the funny part about the Luger is after his arrest, one of the police officers took it home, never booked it into evidence. And apparently nobody at the prosecutor's office looked for this weapon. And it was found by the officer's children after he died in 1990. They were going through some things and found this Luger and a bunch of evidence envelopes and these shell casings, and they turned it all back in. Unfortunately, I mean, obviously this is a, a horrible tragedy and this is probably something that could have been prevented. I don't know the the state of mind of this individual. I can't speak to that, but it sounds like he was, he was picked on quite a bit and he really felt that these people had wronged him. It looks very much to be a revenge type killing. And if anybody that got in the way of, or stood in the way of him carrying this out was going to be collateral damage. Obviously that officer knew that this, unfortunately a dark day, 
history that we would like to to not have in the first place, but he knew that this was kind of a moment in history. I'm just surprised the prosecutor's office, they had all these murder indictments against him, even though he was not incarcerated, not one day. They had the murder indictments. I'm just surprised they didn't notice the weapon was missing. So where do they send him after he is convicted? So he went to, well, he was never convicted. He was okay. never tried. He was never nothing. These All the murder indictments were dropped. So what happened was the district attorney at the time, Mitchell Cohen, made a decision to have him sent to a psychiatric hospital instead of to jail. Now, they could have had a psychiatrist evaluate him while he was incarcerated, which is the usual process. For whatever reason, he bypassed the usual system and sent him right to the hospital for further evaluation. I think the reason for that was just the extent of the crime. The thing people just didn't do that. They thought he must be insane. So once he got to the psychiatric hospital, they were waiting for the psychiatrist to say that he was sane and could stand trial. So he was just being held at Trenton Psychiatric Hospital and he never got out. They just, they, and in 1980, they just dropped the murder indictments against him. So they, he never stood trial. He was, the indictments were dropped. Um, and he was just held on a psychiatric commitment until he died. Now you've repeated a couple names there. We have some Cohen's that were victims. We have the prosecutor with the last name Cohen. Is that just purely a coincidence? That was a coincidence. There was no relation whatsoever. Now, given your background and applying it to what you've learned of of this case and about Howard, uh, and your research and speaking with other people, what would your evaluation be? And, and, and we all know you've, you did not speak with him face to face. So we have that hurdle to get over, but what would have your evaluation been of, from what you've been able to gather? You know, I wrestled with that because he had relationships. He had relationships with this Harry Roselle that visited him to the day he died. Um, There are letters between the two of them. He didn't exhibit any real symptoms of schizophrenia, though he was diagnosed as schizophrenic. He didn't hear voices. He wasn't delusional. There was no break with reality. The only thing he had was he was paranoid, that he felt um, that people were intentionally trying to harm him or thinking bad things about him. But given the snapshot of what was happening on that block when he was living there, some of that was reality-based. Um, I don't know whether he was there, a psychiatrist that looked at it that said he had a personality disorder, um, that he was just antisocial with some paranoid coloring to it. Um, there was a thought on my part, maybe he was on the spectrum, that he might mm-hmm. have had uh, autism, that he was on the higher functioning autistic scale. And that's why people were picking up that there was something off about him, that he was the target of all of this. So I'm not quite sure. He's certainly a really interesting case for people to look at. And I think people could look at it and everybody could come up with a different opinion. I think what's clear is he did not hit all the marks for classic schizophrenia. And you're so right. When we look at these cases from yesteryear, especially ones that are decades and decades old, it's very commonplace for society to just go, all right, only a crazy person would have done what he did. So there's your evaluation right there. That's enough proof for all of us. Let's put them in the uh, loony bin, so to speak, and and lock lock them up and throw away the key. I think your evaluation is very interesting and intriguing. And certainly in 1949, I don't think that we had a good understanding, if much understanding at all, regarding things like PTSD and he very likely could have not likely it's just it's it's even probably highly probable that he had some form of PTSD from his time in the war would you agree oh yeah absolutely and you know at the time there were no there was a veterans affair administration but there were no real treatment for these veterans that were coming back and you say that From what you found, it appears that he always wore his combat boots. The people that reported him talking about him, and I found this film of people that were interviewed in 1979, and that was very helpful. All Yes, they said he always wore his combat boots. That would go very much along the lines of the paranoia that you you spoke of. It's, it's It's like he's waiting for 
the war or some kind of conflict to break out and he's making sure that he's ready at all times 24 7 with these boots on yeah i don't i don't know why he wore them i don't know if he felt more comfortable in them he was waiting for combat whether he felt he was at war with everybody in the neighborhood but um it's pretty consistent that he wore them continuously and it's probably likely that he does himself didn't know why he was wearing them all of the time it's a it's a crazy story it's a very tragic story um but uh an, an intriguing one at that and it does look like it, this is one of the first recorded uh american mass shootings yes is there anything else that we should know about the book or about you or about uh howard unra or anything else before we wrap up here today ellen no i think it's a complicated story and i did the best mm-hmm. that i could to put it on the page to try to bring that neighborhood to life i did consider writing it in a straight non-fiction documentary kind of style And I played around with it. And then I decided that I was going to do this in a more creative nonfiction way, though it's all completely, I spent two years doing research on this and it interviewed hundreds of people. So it's all fact-based, but I wanted it to read more like a novel Mm -hmm. than maybe a a different format that true crime people are used to reading where it's more just um, newspaper style fact, uh, you know, nonfiction based. Well, the book is called Murder in the Neighborhood, the true story of America's first recorded mass shooting by Ellen J. Green. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Green, for speaking with us today. Is there a website or anything that anybody would need to know to uh, to find this good book? Yeah, ellenjgreen.com. Um, it's available on Amazon. Perfect. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. One of the privileges of being a part of True Crime Garage is we get to talk to experts on these cases. Fascinating people who have great insights into these fascinating cases. Now, as we've already said here, Captain, Unruh killed 13 people, injured three. Those killed, their ages range from as young as two years old up to 68 years old. Now, we do know that some of the Cohen family, if not all of the Cohen family, was a target for Howard, and he killed three members of the Cohen family. Dr. Maurice J. Cohen, age 39, his mother, Minnie Cohen, who was age 63, and the doctor's wife, Rose Cohen, age 38. Howard Barton Unruh was and has been labeled as a schizophrenic spree killer and family annihilator. Now, as explained yesterday, spree killers and serial killers fall into their own categories per the FBI and just general definitions that we've applied to those titles over the years and decades since Howard Unruh killed all these people. Howard Unruh absolutely was a mass murderer. And while many have called him the first in America, as you heard there from Ellen Green, he most certainly was one of the first and labeled this by many an author and reporter, but he was just one of the first. He actually wasn't the first in America. Also, as you heard there from Ms. Green, the schizophrenic portion part is certainly up for debate and probably just wrong. We need to keep in mind, this is 1949, and things were really looked at very differently back then than they are today. And this is a situation where, He goes out and kills 13 people, probably intended to kill upwards of 20 or so people. And when this is reviewed by society in that day, the person has to be crazy. There's no other explanation for it back then. And they have to give some kind of term. And as you heard Ms. Green, he certainly didn't hit all the markers for a typical schizophrenic individual. And so he is given this label and kept this label all of these years. And in fact, that what that is what leads him to not being actually charged in these cases. You know, he never has to go to court for all of these people that he killed. And after he's arrested, he basically gives a very meticulous account and detailed account of his actions. It's almost like he's reciting things from his diary from war. And so he's able to give a calm and sober, meticulous account of his actions 
from earlier that day to police, to detectives, to law enforcement. And so they send him off to Cooper Hospital for treatment and to be evaluated. And eventually he's diagnosed to be paranoid schizophrenic by psychologists and he's deemed to be insane. And so therefore he does not ever really spend any time in an actual prison and he doesn't have to go to court and face these actual charges. He goes off to the Trenton Psychiatric Hospital where he remained there until his death in 2009. And he lived to be 88 years old, passing away October 19th, 2009 at the Trenton Psychiatric Hospital in Trenton, New Jersey. You could pick anywhere to be, but you join us each week, and that's why we love you. Thank you so much for the support. We couldn't do it without you. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful, 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 beautiful listeners? Why, yes, we do, Captain. Of course, we heard true crime author Ellen J. Green here with us today talking about her latest and greatest book, Murder in the Neighborhood, the True Story of America's First Recorded Mass Shooting. 28-year-old Howard Barton Unruh shot 13 people in less than 12 minutes on his block in East Camden, New Jersey. Ellen Green uncovers the chilling true story of Howard Unruh, the quiet oddball who meticulously plotted his revenge on the neighbors who shunned him and became one of America's first mass killers. Check out Murder in the Neighborhood by Ellen J. Green. You can find that great title and many more on our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. And when you're there, make sure you sign up for our mailing list. We'll see you next week. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't live. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.